how, what was the trocar placement for thoracoscopic TEF? And, uh, and, it, and he was a general surgeon in a small community and he wanted to do a thoracoscopic. And I told him, I didn't think that was a very good idea because he really did mostly adults. And I couldn't imagine a general surgeon trying to do a TF, let alone do it thoracoscopically. But it was amazing. I, they, I think that hospital, I'm forgetting the name of the surgeon who invited me, um, but they had like 50 or 60 TFs a year. Uh, we are uh, some places have like at least three, four coming a day. Yeah, it's crazy. One hospital. Yeah, and, and many of the children, they couldn't operate on, you know, they just couldn't, there were not the resources. Yeah. Or they came so late that they were, you know, already almost dead. It was, it was sad, but I, I always thought it would be a great training for our, our trainees to come to, uh, come to India to train because you have such huge volumes. It will be our pleasure if you can. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's live on YouTube now. Yeah, yeah, I can just yeah, one myself. minute to go. We are live. Yeah, in, in two minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'll take a few seconds uh, to just introduce you a little bit and then I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Our uh, chairperson, Dr. Luthra, was supposed to join us. I don't know. She's stuck somewhere. Maybe in the end she will join. Let's see. Yeah, we can see people joining on YouTube. List is increasing. I hope we're charging a lot. Oh no. <laughs> I wish <laughs> we are live though. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Dr. Kirti, Dr. Meera is here. Huh? Okay. Hi. Uh, Hello. Hi. She is Dr. Lukra. She is the chairperson of PACI this year. Very nice to meet Hello. you. Hi. Uh, welcome. Dr. Steve, very nice to have you. I'm so happy that you could take out time to address the PESI and all over India, we are waiting for your talk. Well, it's, it's my honor. I appreciate the invitation. Mm -hmm. So, Carry on. yeah, we can start. So, so yes, we can see a lot of pediatric surgeons in India are quite enthusiastic and we are privileged, as said by many, to have you and to do this first webinar of PACI for us. As we all know, Dr. Stephen Rothenberg, he is the chief of Rocky Mountain Children's Hospital, Delver, Colorado. He is one of the founding members of IPEG. He has done the first thoracoscopic precursor fistula repair. I think it was two decades ago, if I'm right. It's long. And uh, he has received the prestigious Sages Minor Surgical Endoscopic Award in 2015. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll hand, hand it uh, over to you now for the okay. uh, webinar. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great honor for me to talk with you. I'm, I'm sorry we can't do this in person, but I think we're all learning uh, how to, to learn and, and talk remotely. Hopefully someday in the near future, we'll all be able to meet uh, as friends again. But in the meantime, it's a, it's a great honor for me to, to speak with you this morning. Um, I, I'm gonna talk this morning about uh, uh, kind of my journey over the last 25, 30 years um, in thoracic surgery and, and really um, trying to eliminate the morbidity of uh, thoracotomy um, in children. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and let me know if you uh, if you're seeing it. Yes, yes, I, we can see you as well. All right, I'm just going to. Uh, all right, 
So are you seeing that okay? Yeah. Should be the whole thing now. Nice so basically, I've, you know, I've always had an interest in thoracic surgery since I was a, a medical student. And at one point I was thinking I would be a cardiac uh, thoracic surgeon. Um, but then I did a pediatric surgery rotation and, and really fell in love with neonatal surgery and especially um, infant and children thoracic surgery. And so I kind of changed course um, and to, to become a pediatric surgeon instead. Um, these are my disclosures. I do work with these companies, Just Right Surgical, um, Storts, and ConMed. But this, I think, really gets to it. And this is a, this is a Facebook post um, from a, 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 a site uh, called Born Unable to Swallow. And it's been put together um, by some patients and some families who have children were born with esophageal atresia. And this mother allowed me to put this post in the talk and it says, hi all, panicking mother here. This is my 11 year old son who's old enough to dress himself, shower himself, etc., And then never stands still. Therefore I haven't really noticed before, but his back and shoulders are rather uneven. Can anyone shed light on this please? And thank you. And so, you know, this child had a, you can't see a scar really over here, but he had an open, an open, uh, esophageal atresia repair. And because of that, he's got significant scoliosis. He's got a wing scapula and he's got significant shoulder girdle deformity because he had an open thoracotomy as an infant. And I believe that as pediatric surgeons, this is one of the most morbid incisions that we do. Uh, even if you, you know, take precautions, do muscle sparing. And so my goal has really been to uh, eliminate that. And this has been sort of my uh, journey over the last almost 30 years now, it started with developing a muscle sparing, a complete muscle sparing technique for getting in the chest to try and minimize that morbidity. And then going to sort of a video assisted approach to now everything we do is done completely thoracoscopically with no um, thoracotomy incision at all. I was very fortunate after my general surgery, um, I had a gap year between my general surgery and when I started my thoracic surgery. Uh, and I got, to, I got a thoracic uh, fellowship at Broad Green Hospital in Liverpool. And so I got a chance to go do adult, mostly adults, um, open thoracic surgery for a whole year. And, and what that really did was, you know, allow me to really understand the anatomy of the chest and get very comfortable with the anatomy and with dealing with large blood vessels um, and tumors and things like that. Um, and it was an incredible experience. This, I owe a lot to this man. This is Mr. Donnelly, Raymond Donnelly. He was my consultant. And he was probably the, the, the best technical surgeon I had ever seen, um, I've ever had the opportunity to work with. He could do a, a open pneumonectomy in an hour. He could do a, a gastric pull-up for esophageal cancer in about two and a half hours. But he really taught me, you know, the anatomy of the chest, how to approach a surgery, how to be efficient. Even though this was all open, it had a huge impact um, on my development as a surgeon, I think. It allowed me the confidence, gave me the confidence to try and push these procedures thoracoscopically. We did it a little bit of thoracoscopy there, but it was very primitive. It was with a rigid trocar and a rigid scope. And it was mostly to do like pleural biopsies in patients who had asbestosis and things like that. Um, but it really was an amazing year. The other thing I, I learned while I was there is he was a, a rabid football fan and he would take me to uh, the Liverpool games and this very staid Scotsman who never, uh, never raised its voice in the OR, never had any inflection, would go absolutely nuts at every football game he took me to. So it was a, it was a great cultural uh, experience. And this is my wife. And this was at that time, our, our only child, my, my oldest, Jessica. Uh, and we had a great time exploring all over England and uh, Northern England and Southern England. And we also um, had a chance to travel extensively in Europe. And, and so it was a great year in, in many ways. So as you know, the traditional or standard approaches to access to the thoracic cavity are, are all the types of thoracotomies uh, listed here. 
And one thing I became interested in England, I actually wrote a paper on it, was using a muscle sparing approach. And I got to do enough, um, I got to do enough surgeries and some bilaterally, uh, like for pleurectomies or for patients who had uh, recurrent pneumothoraces, that it became very apparent to me that if you did a muscle sparing procedure, that there was significantly less pain and morbidity associated with it in an adult and that it was worth pursuing. But there still was significant um, morbidity with it. But so I tried to work on ways of minimizing our impact and getting in the chest. I also did a lot of uh, mediastinoscopy, um, and that was a terrifying procedure um, where we would get biopsies, paratracheal biopsies, and things like that. But you really couldn't see very well, but it got me a little bit more comfortable with using a scope and being at distance from the pathology I had to work on. And then again, the most common procedure we usually do is a lateral or posterior lateral thoracotomy. The advantages are, you know, we have wide access to the chest. You can come in at various uh, inner spaces. You can get anterior and posterior mediastinal masses, but it's very difficult to get at the apex of the chest through that incision. Um, you have to divide the large chest muscles, you know, unless you do a, a complete muscle sparing. It's very painful and there's lim limited access through the ribs. Um, and here just sort of shows that, um, you know, that posterior lateral thoracotomy incision and the procedures that we would use it for, empyema, pneumothorax, uh, anterior and posterior mediastinal masses, and TEF repair. Um, so, you know, here's a child that came to me for a hernia repair, and she actually was born with a TEF. And you can see um, her incision, um, and it's not bad, you know, it's not that obvious. But if you really look closely at her chest, you can see that she has um, she has an asymmetric chest and she has a winging of her right scapula. So even a, a, a case where we feel like we've done a great job, if we really look at it critically, we can see that actually she has a significant uh, deformity. And so I think we need to be really critical about our results and what we're doing uh, and be honest with it. And of course, here's a terrible result. This is very obvious. And, and these cases still happen. And people, even though people say I use a muscle sparing technique or I never have any problems with it, it can still be a big issue. Some people say use an axillary thoracotomy, you know, that that hides the incision, it's in the axilla, you preserve the muscles. Well, you know, this isn't a very nice incision either. Uh, and it is difficult to access and you don't see as well. And I think one of the keys with thoracoscopy is you just see everything so well. You know, I think anybody who says you see it better through an open thoracotomy is really not being honest. So when I started my fellowship in Houston after leaving England, I got everybody interested in the idea of doing a muscle sparing approach. And we wrote this paper and it was published in 1992. So I'm really dating myself, but this was, you know, really the, the start of trying to minimize the impact of what we did. And we had excellent results. And I do think that we improved the outcomes, but I, I didn't think it was good enough. And then I, um, you know, got to know uh, Dr. Brad Rogers, who really is the father of pediatric thoracoscopy. And I got a chance to talk to him and he actually started publishing about this, uh, you know, in basically when I was still in high school. And, and he took, what he did is he took uh, a set of cystoscopy instruments. So rigid trocars and rigid instruments and a telescope without a camera head. And he would go in and do pleural biopsies um, and debridements um, in, in children. And the most amazing thing is he actually did this with them awake and spontaneously breathing. They were not innovative. And so when people tell me that I'm crazy, I just tell them they should talk to Brad Rogers because he was totally nuts to be. And, and he got all sorts of um, you know, negative feedback for doing this, but he really, you know, paved the way for, for what we're doing today. And then as I got interested in this, I started looking for every, every way I could to try and um, advance, advance, you know, minimally invasive approaches. And the initial thing was really doing lung biopsies. And we have a hospital in Denver called National Jewish. It's a world renowned respiratory hospital. And I went and I found the head of the pediatric department and I actually took him and I made him come watch an animal lab 
where I did a, a lung biopsy using the endo GIA, the new 12 millimeter stapler and showed him I can do this. And a week later, he sent me a case with this cavitatory lesion that you sort of see up on the right side and um, up here. And, and he said, and we did it and we ended up diagnosing the patient had Legionella, um, which we never would have diagnosed without the biopsy. And then we started doing a lot more lung biopsies, especially for interstitial lung disease, because it really did change your therapy. And this kind of revolutionized how we approach things. So I was very fortunate to have some, some good supporters on the medical side, pulmonologists who believed in getting tissue. So what are the advantages? Well, there's decreased pain, obviously, in morbidity, uh, decreased surgical stress. That's been shown in, in many, uh, many studies that measure markers. Clearly, there's a quicker recovery, return to normal activity, decreased musculoskeletal problems, certainly a shorter hospitalization. I mean, many of our lung resections go home the next day. But also, not only the kids, people say kids don't need to go back to work. But as you know, by getting a kid home quicker and getting back to normal activity, the parents can return to their normal activity. And then I think we see things so much better. Um, and obviously, it's cosmetically superior. The disadvantages are it takes a new mindset, it's technically demanding, it requires special instrumentation, and it requires the support of your neonatologist, your pulmonologist, and your anesthesiologist, because they have to support what you're doing and help you to do it. There's an obvious learning curve, um, initially increased operative time, so though now I think we do all these procedures much quicker. Um, and I think it's helpful to have single lung ventilation, especially in formal lung resection. And these are the instrumentation that, that I use primarily, especially in small infants. And it's, you know, these were not available when I started, but um, was able to work with companies like Carl Stortz to help develop these instruments. So these are the three millimeter instruments. Um, so they're short shafted, you know, they're, they're 18 to 20 centimeters in length. They're insulated. They do all the things we need. We now use high definition cameras um, and, and energy sources. And so, and, but all this has evolved over time. Um, and I almost never use a zero degree scope anymore. I always, basically the scope I use all the time is a, is a 30 degree four millimeter scope. It's a wide angle scope. So it gives you almost the same picture as a five millimeter, um, but it's a bit smaller and you can use a four millimeter trocar. The other thing was that when I came in, you know, there were no, uh, there were, there were no, staplers or energy devices um, you know that would fit in the side in the chest of a small child and despite the fact that I spoke with um, then US surgical um, or, or and or Covidian and and Ethicon about making smaller devices they just would never do it and it turns out it's because they didn't think the market was big enough and for them to take on a new device they had to show that it was going to be a billion dollar market. And so a little over 10 years ago, I was fortunate to work with some of the past presidents who'd worked at, at um, Covidian and in their energy um, uh, division. And they had left the company and they came to me and said, well, we've been listening to you and we think we can do what you want to do. And so we started our own company uh, just right uh, to make a three millimeter vessel sealer and a five millimeter stapler and soon be coming out with a new um, five millimeter sealer cutter and some open devices. But it really has changed the way we do this. And I think the safety, and also it enables, I think, surgeons who might not have as much experience with thoracoscopy to do it better and safer. And this is the handpiece that I, we developed and I got to tell them what it needed to look like. I can't honestly tell you exactly the, the mechanics of it, but I said it needs to look and work like a, a three millimeter um, Maryland dissector, and it does. So anesthesia, you know, in most cases, there's many cases that we do where we can just use, sing, um, use a, a tracheal intubation. For instance, TEFs, we don't use single lung ventilation. Lung biopsies, we don't. Anterior posterior mediastinal masses usually don't. But if we're doing a, a formal lung resection, I do think it's helpful to have a quiet lung if you can get it. And so we usually do a main stem intubation of the contralateral side. Uh, I think that's preferable to using blockers, double lumen tubes and all that. 
You will see an increase in the end tidal CO2, um, but this is manageable and all the anesthesiologist has to do is increase um, their tidal volume a little bit, maybe increase the rate, and almost all these children tolerate it without any problem. The other issue was having special equipment and you know things like endo loops, um, endo clips. There were no five millimeter clips when I started doing this. There were only 10 millimeter clips. Um, and we, I was able to help convince some of the companies to build a five millimeter clip. We still need a three millimeter clip, but it's, and there actually are designs out there, but again, they're not being developed because the market's small. And then endoscopic staplers, you know, are great, but they're large. And then really the thing that revolutionized for me, um, thoracic surgery was vessel sealing. And this is an old video of mine. This is an upper lobectomy. These are, um, and that instrument that you see in there is, um, is the old ligature. This is the LS1000 and you can see it's huge in this chest. And this is, I think this is like an eight month old or something, but the device is huge. It takes up too much room, but it did enable me to develop this technique of making on pulmonary vessels of making two separate seals. So I didn't want a device that actually sealed and cut. I wanted a device that allowed me to make separate seals like I was putting on suture ligatures so that I could then cut between them so that I knew it was safe. And so this technique, and you'll see me use it over and over again, is I make proximal and distal seals. Uh, and then I'll make a small cut between the seals um, to make sure that the seals are intact. Uh, so I'll cut part way. And so here you see I've made a big proximal seal on the main trunk and then distal seals on these two branching vessels. And then I'll just cut part way and see until I see a lumen and make sure that the seals are intact. Because I think you have to anticipate that everything will fail. And here you can see a lumen, I see no bleeding, and now I know it's safe to go ahead and cut. And I still use this technique today. I, will, I won't use a device except on a very small one millimeter vessel that seals and cuts a pulmonary vessel all in one. Because if the seal fails and you get bleeding, you have no ability to recover. You just, it doesn't take very much blood to fill up the chest so you can't see and then you end up having to convert. Now here's a, this is an example of what not to do. This is a lower lobectomy. This is probably one of the first 15 or 20 I did. And this is the inferior pulmonary vein. This is the trunk. And here you can see me putting that ligature on it. I don't have a good length of vessel established. So the, the key to safety is having a good length of the vessel exposed. I'm right on the pericardium. So if something goes wrong, the vessel could retract into the pericardium and the child could bleed to death. I can't see my tips. Um, this is just horrible, horrible technique. Uh, but um, so here you can see I made the two separate seals. They're not far enough apart, but luckily because you know, and then I make a cut and I see bleeding right away. So I was able to put the sealer back in and I was very lucky that I was able to get enough of it to get it sealed, but, and it ended up working out. So of course, when I presented this video and I think the first time I did was in, it, in uh, Italy, I, I edited all this part out so nobody knew how stupid I was, but this is horrible technique uh, and you should never ever do it that way. So what are the exclusion criteria for thoracoscopy? Well, they're almost non-existent anymore. You know, I still think if someone's hemodynamically unstable and they require significant pressure support, it's probably not a good idea. Although occasionally we will do PDA ligations that way. Um, I think being on a non-conventional ventilator like an oscillator is not a contraindication. Usually we'd like to bring the patients to the OR, but occasionally we have done them in the NICU or the PICU. Um, and I don't do it if they're on ECMO. And then giant tumors, I think, is a, a relative non-indication, but it depends on what you're dealing with. And these are all the procedures that we perform successfully thoracoscopy. So basically, every operation that I do, we're able to do thoracoscopically. The key with positioning, so when I started, you know, basically everybody went in a lateral to cube disposition like we did open, and that's completely wrong. You want to maximize your exposure. You want to use gravity to retract the lungs. So if we're doing a posterior mediastinal structure, we paste the patient almost prone or about 30 degrees up. Uh, same anterior mediastinal, they are supine about 30 degrees up. So we have access for our trocars. And don't worry about setting up the patient in case you have to convert to open. If you have to convert to open, we all know how to do it. We can do it quickly. Set the patient up so that you're 
you know, you're optimizing your chance of success in the surgery. So you really have to set yourself up to succeed. Uh, if you don't, you could end up like this skier. So lateral decubitus we use for lung biopsy, lobectomy, decortication. We almost never do decortications anymore. Uh, anterior mediastinal mass, you can see here is that supine position with the left side elevated about 30 degrees. And then posterior mediastinal mass, uh, the patient's rolled forward, allowing gravity to push the lung out of the way. And this is the standard room setup. The surgeon and the assistant have to be on the same side. So they're working um, in tandem. And so that there's nobody's working in a paradox. If you put your assistant on the other side of the table, they're often working against the camera and they can't assist you effectively if they're working in a paradox. So both the surgeon and the assistant need to be on the same side, looking at the pathology, looking at the monitor. The first thing I do is create a pneumothorax. Uh, this is in almost every case. So I'll insert a Barry's needle, a low flow, low pressure of CO2, or, you know, a liter per minute, usually start at a pressure of four to six. And this is to collapse the lung to prevent injury when I put in the trocars. Um, so the first actually advanced procedure I did thoracoscopically was a PDA ligation. There was a surgeon in France named Laborde who started doing this in the early 90s. Um, and I had read about it and I was lucky that I trained to do PDA ligations open when I was in my fellowship in Houston. And so I talked to cardiologists into letting me try to do this thoracoscopically. Uh, and we did a lot of these. Now we don't get to do as many anymore because the neonatologists are not ligating as many and the cardiologists are putting in occluder devices. But in my hospital, the patients usually are given the option of having an open thoracotomy, a thoracoscopic ligation or occluding device. And, and I think in the smaller infants that thoracoscopically is the best way to go. And this is what it looks like. Um, so here the patient is, you know, again, um, up on their, uh, it's left side up, but they're tilted forward about 45 degrees. There's the aorta uh, and we, I open a pleural flap over the aorta and I use that to retract uh, the vagus and recurrent nerve medially. Here you can see the, the vagus nerve right there and you can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve coming around. Um, and then, you know, it's, in the smaller children, it's actually hard to get completely around the ductus because of the angles. Um, and so what I do is I dissect from below and below to create a nice plane. I make sure I see the nerve, which is right there and that it's away from that. And then, you know, in truth, I could probably use the sealer to close these, but I usually put on a clip, um, which I, I may start switching. So this is, this is why I say this is a five millimeter clip. You can see how large it looks in this child but just a single clip to occlude it. Uh, this is extremely safe. I have had two cases where the clip has scissored and cut the ductus and I had to emergently go in. I don't really know why that happens. I think the jaws get misaligned some, but we've now done a couple hundred of these. Um, we have a recurrent nerve injury rate of, of around 1% um, and those tend to recover with time. One child hasn't um, and a very low conversion rate. As I said, empyema was another early procedure that I was doing. We almost never do this anymore. We treat all these patients with a pigtail catheter and TPA. But I think in, in you know, recurrent cases that don't resolve or tougher cases, this is still a nice way to go in and, and clean out the chest. Um, foregut duplications, this is a great initial procedure to learn because it's pretty much avascular. Um, you know, this is a child, one of the first ones I did, it was a foregut duplication sitting just down on the diaphragm. Uh, I was able to resect it uh, and the child actually went home the next day. And this is probably almost, you know, 20 years ago. But, you know, they can be more challenging. And here's a large one in an older child. Um, he was having respiratory and uh, eating issues. This is the room set up. So again, the surgeon and the SA on the same side, the patient's in a left lateral decubitus position, rolled forward, uh, monitors directly across from them. There's the port placement. And so for posterior mediastinal masses, I put the camera more posteriorly behind the tip of the scapula. And then I put my right and left hand uh, to try and um, have my right and left hand at 90 degrees to the area where I'm doing the most difficult part of the operation. And you can see in this case, it's quite inflamed and stuck. Um, 
And there's a lot of adherence, a lot of, you know, bleeding because of, of the inflammation. You know, this, this again, had been there uh, for a couple of years. But you'd see I just gently work around it, separating it off the lung, using the, the vessel sealer to seal tissue to try and minimize bleeding, using it to dissect. And also you can do a lot of sealing and teasing the tissues away. And we just gradually keep working around it. Um, but it was quite adherent to the lung. And then it was quite adherent to the inferior pulmonary vein below. And so um, you really need to be quite careful and methodical as you do this. Um, and I'm actually helping uh, the, the pediatric surgery resident in New York do this case. Um, but he's working around it. Um, I try not to uh, puncture the cyst, at least initially, because I think it helps in the dissection. Um, and here you can see it, we're starting to peel it off the inferior pulmonary vein. And the vein is just sitting right there. It's densely adherent to it. So again, this, this idea of sealing tissue and then teasing it down off is really a very safe technique. And it helps prevent um, inadvertently injuring the vein, which you see right here is just plastered onto this thing. So it, it is a bit of a tricky dissection. Um, at this point, he had ruptured it. Um, I always tell the fellow if they rupture the cyst during the case that they owe me a case of beer. Um, he still hasn't paid up, but maybe someday. So here you can see the pulmonary vasculature coming in. It's a beautiful view. And, and as we continue to dissect, what becomes apparent is that the cyst comes off way up by the carina. Um, and here you can see, so here's the left main stem bronchus over here. You'll see it better in a minute. And we just keep working up, gradually dissecting around, taking what's easy um, and trying not to injure any of the vital structures. You can see it's really adhering up here. And so here's the left main stem right here. The right main stem is going in over there and we're dissecting at the base of this and working towards it. And eventually we'll get down to a very narrow, a very narrow neck. But the nice thing about using the energy device here is there's no heat spread. This three millimeter vessel sealer there's, you, don't, you don't have to worry at all about injuring the bronchus, the surrounding lung. There's no heat spread outside of the jaws. And so we'll just keep going back. I think it's important to dissect as much of this out. Sometimes there's a common wall and sometimes you can't completely resect it, in which case you need to sort of marsupialize the mucosa. But here you can see the neck of it and it comes right in at the carina. It's right at the carina. And so we're just gonna endo loop that um, and ligate it. And so that, you know, this kid did quite well and went home the, the next morning. Also use it in mediastinal tumors. This is an older case, but this is a case of a parathyroid adenoma. But again, the view is incredible. And, you know, otherwise we would have probably had to do uh, a median pseudotomy to get at this thing and to, to see it so well. We do all our thymectomies, thoracoscopically, um, parathyroid tumors, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic biopsies. Uh, a lot of the teratomas we see we're able to do thoracoscopically. Um, I just think it, you get such great visualization. So, and this is probably the largest tumor I ever took out. Um, this was, a, was gonna be done, they had gotten a biopsy percutaneously. They thought it was a ganglion neuroma. They were gonna go see another surgeon who was gonna do an open thoracotomy. They came to me and said, yeah, I think I can get it out thoracoscopically. And this was, uh, a long time ago, you know, we can see I'm using five millimeter, the five millimeter um, sealer, uh, the visualization, but this was a huge tumor. The actually, the hardest part of this was that um, actually once I got the tumor off of the, the spine and got it separated was actually getting it into a bag. And I apologize, the quality of this video is poor, but the reason they were interested in having this done is this child was a, um, a piano prodigy and she had a very important audition um, for a music school back east uh, that was supposed to happen. Here you can see I'm trying to get it in this uh, 15 millimeter bag. It's quite difficult. Um, but here uh, they, the parents sent me uh, these pictures. So I had to make a little thoracotomy so I could get it out. But this is her one week after the surgery. Uh -huh. Thank 
So you can see that she really has no morbidity or problems because of the surgery. She's able to move, use her right arm, I mean her left arm without any difficulty at all in, in any restriction. So lung resections, this is you know one of my great interests and we do it for interstitial lung disease I talked about, metastatic or primary cancers. The biggest thing we do it for is congenital lung lesions. Um, and then we do it for infectious reasons, severe bronchiectasis, um, cavitary lesions, things such as that. Um, this is just a breakdown. The, the nomenclature has changed repeatedly, but basically uh, we do this uh, for CPAMs and sequestrations, which are really just kind of a, a continuation of the same spectrum. Um, prenatally, we see a lot of these patients prenatally now, probably the majority of them. They all get a prenatal ultrasound, which we follow along. I don't necessarily get a prenatal MRI because it's just not gonna change at all what I do. Um, it's not helpful. When the babies are born, if there are no respiratory distress, we just get a chest X-ray to make sure everything looks okay. And then I will generally bring them back at, at somewhere around you know, between four to eight weeks of age um, and get a CT scan to identify the lesion, make sure it's there. As you know, many of these regress and go away. But a chest X-ray or an ultrasound are not adequate to say a lesion has completely gone away. You need to get a CT scan and the MRI is just not sensitive enough yet. So all these patients get a CT scan. If they have a lesion, we take it out. My preference is to do it early, like around three months of age. I know many people wait much longer and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. I just think it's easier and, and less of a problem. The technique I use is all, basically always a three port technique. In infants, it's a four millimeter trocar for the scope and two three millimeter ports. And then I'll usually switch to a five millimeter port so I can use endoscopic stapler. Um, they're all in a lateral decubitus position and I always operate from front to back. When I did open thoracotomies, I would always start at the back. I would stand at the back and work forward. But now I, I had many of the things I learned like a PDA ligation, uh, four gut duplications. I learned it's actually much easier if you stand at the front of the patient because you have more space as opposed to being at the back when we do an open thoracotomy. And it's critical to understand the anatomic relationships in lung resections, to understand where the, the segmental vessels are, where, how they branch, and that also wherever there's a, you know, an artery, there's usually a bronchus uh, right there with it um, to, that helps you identify the anatomy and dissect. So it's, and because you can't put your hand in there and feel, it's really important to, to understand the anatomy. So there are simple things like this. This is a little extra low bar sequestration. This is a, a really old video, but the key here is really just to make sure that you don't tear that vessel. So we dissect it out. This is a long time ago and I would still use hook cautery in these areas. This is actually a pretty short vessel, but I wanna get as much length as I can. Uh, the worst thing you can do is obviously tear this vessel right on the aorta. Uh, you know, that's a, it's a disastrous thing. And then at this point, what we had were five millimeter clips. And so we put on a few clips um, and then cut between them. And, you know, this surgery took like 15 minutes. But bad things can happen, even with clips. So here's a case I was helping, one of the first cases I helped in New York. And the surgeon, I wanted to use the ligature on this, but the surgeon wanted to use a clip. And I said, okay. But he put the clip in and he didn't preload it. And when he fired it, there was no clip in it and he tore the vessel. But luckily, because we had so much length, I was able to get control immediately. Um, and I was able, and we ended up using the ligature for it. So the key here really here is length. So that if something goes wrong, that you have proximal control and you can get at it. And we just got very lucky in this case. The other thing is if you get into bleeding like that, First thing you should do is try to get control. The second thing you should do is put in another trocar so that you can have a hand use suction so you can see. Now here's a, here's a, a case. This is a number of years old now, um, about five. This was probably one of the largest sequestration vessels I've ever seen. This was an intralobar sequestration. This is a five millimeter clip. Again, I'm helping the fellow do this case and I'm almost having a heart attack while he's trying to uh, put this clip on it. You can see that the clip is just way too small uh, for this vessel. And I should have stopped him, but I let him put on a few clips and you'll see. So he puts on a bunch of clips. Um, 
That one almost gets all the way across, but now he's put on all these other clips and none of them get across. And I don't really like using clips anymore in, in thoracic surgery. I will occasionally do it, but I worry about them tearing. I worry about them coming off. Uh, this one's not quite across. So, you know, I look at this and I say, well, that's just not good. We can't cut that vessel. That's crazy. Um, and now the next part is, you'll see this is kind of scary, is that I'm actually able to pull these clips off, which is also kind of horrifying. Um, but I'm able to do it. And then this was the first case that we had the five millimeter stapler available in, in New York. And so I thought, well, I've got proximal control. I have these clips proximally, so I don't think there'll be much bleeding. So let's try the stapler. And the stapler is great if the vessel is, is larger than one centimeter. If it's smaller than one centimeter, there may not be enough tissue um, for the staples, but this is clearly bigger than a centimeter when compressed. And we use the stapler on it and the stapler lays down uh, four rows of two millimeter staples. And you can see here that we'll get uh, an excellent secure cut. I have proximal control with the clips and then I'm keeping control. And so here you can see there's a, a great staple line. So it, it worked quite well. And I use the stapler a lot now um, in thoracic surgery. The other thing is we often have cases where there's you know, large cysts or fluid filled spaces and there's no room to work. So this, this was a, a three week old who presented in acute distress was not a prenatally diagnosed, um, actually uh, went into respiratory arrest in the CT scan. And so the first thing I do is I go in and I use the energy device to compress the cyst so that I can um, collapse it and have room to work. And now once I have room to, I've collapsed it and I'll spend 20 minutes doing this if I need to, now I can manipulate the lung and I can see where I need to operate and work. And so that, that makes it much better. The other thing is often there's an incomplete fissure, which I think makes it very hard for people. Don't really have time today to talk about that, but I use, I use vessel sealing, these sealing devices, to complete the fissure so that I can safely get across the lung tissue, have no air leak and find where the vessels are. So here you can see, I was able to dissect out one of the upper lobe vessels. Um, again, that same seal, seal and divide technique. So one of the keys I've learned is, is trocar placement. And what I find is that many people put the trocars too far posteriorly. So you can see my trocar, my camera port is actually anterior to the tip of the scapula, almost in the mid axillary line, between the mid and posterior axillary line. And then my right and left hand operating ports are more towards the anterior axillary line or even a, a little bit more forward. And that allows me to look down on my instruments while I'm operating. If you put the camera port too far posteriorly, then you're looking back on yourself in a paradox and that makes it much difficult, much more difficult. This way that camera port is looking right over the fissure, right where you're operating. And I think this, this is where a lot of surgeons make a mistake and why they struggle with this more. And then again, you know, the ability, we've developed um, this five millimeter stapler, which now makes it very easy to take the bronchus in small children and the vessel sealing, which has revolutionized, I think, thoracic surgery. And again, you see a proximal seal, a distal seal, um, and then I will divide the tissue um, between it. So, you know, I believe these instruments have, have revolutionized um, pediatric surgery. I'm lucky I have them. I know not everybody does, but I think they make a huge difference. So this is the lung biopsy I showed you before, you know, where I used endo loops. And I think this is a good technique. Uh, it's a cheap technique. It, it's relatively quick. I put on two PDS endo loops at the tongue of tissue, but you're somewhat limited to having to get an area where there's, uh, you know, you're really kind of at the an edge of the lung to use an endo loop. And here, down here, you can see I'm using the five millimeter stapler in about a similar size child. This baby had some sort of intravascular accident that tremendously scarred his lung. Um, we, it was very unusual, but you can see in the, I can do, I can one application of the stapler and I'm done before I even sort of get started. And I can take a couple biopsies very quickly. I don't have to be right on the edge of the lung. Um, and it, I think for most people, this feels safer. I don't think you should try to use a 12 millimeter stapler in a child, certainly a child that's probably under 10 kilos, certainly under eight, there's just not enough room in there and a lot of damage can be done. Um, and so I, you know, I hate when people just ram a, 
a 12 millimeter stapler in the chest can barely see what they're doing. And, and like in doing a lobectomy, just put it across the fissure and hope that they don't injure anything. That's crazy. You need to do an anatomic dissection. So this is, we'll kind of go, this is a lower lobectomy. This is a beautiful fissure. So, you know, this is the, I always tell the residents, this is the case my grandmother could do because you see the anatomy so well. But, you know, we'll start working in the fissure. And again, I open up the fissure first, I complete it. I use the vessel sealer for this. And it's great because it dissects and it seals. And then, you know, when the tissue is not thick, I don't even need to cut. I just separate the tissues. And we're going to just keep exposing the artery as it comes through the, comes through the um, fissure. And again, I like to do these early. I like to do these kids around three months of age. The vessels are smaller. They've had no inflammation. Now, I will tell you that people say, well, these kids are asymptomatic, wait till a year. But a, a lot of the kids who we do are, quote unquote, asymptomatic when you get in there. They have significant inflammation in their fissure, and they have a, lar a lot of large lymph nodes that obstruct the vessels, and it just makes the surgery much more difficult. And so if you go in early, then the vessels are pristine and nice like this. But even at three months of age, I've seen inflammation in enlarged vessels, even though the child's completely asymptomatic. So here you can see, again, we have the, a, you know, the fissure that's incomplete, and we're just going to seal and then cut across it. Then I, this is a vessel, so I've made a proximal and distal seal. We're dividing across that. And I'll just keep working my way up here. You can see um, you know, another branch. So these are the, the uh, anterior basal branches right here. Um, and, and I isolate them. You know, I could get it up at the main truck, but you see how the vessel kind of distributes, uh, kind of spread out. So it's hard to get the whole trunk and you wanna make sure you don't injure the lingular artery, which is right here. Again, seal, seal and divide. Um, and then because there's a big, here you can see even in this child, three months old, these enlarged vessels, which get in the way and will bleed. It's not dangerous, but it can be a problem and it just is a little more messy. So again, I like to do it earlier. Um, there's, this is the superior or apical segment vessel. I'll take that separately. And then I have this large trunk uh, the going to the rest of the basal segments. And so in a case like this, you can either, it's a little bit big for the sealer, the sealer will take a five millimeter vessel. So I can either dissect down into the parenchyma here in order to get at the segmental branches, which is fine, just takes a little more work. Or in this case, I'm just gonna put the five millimeter stapler in um, because I have it and it just makes it easier and I can take the whole trunk um, with the vessel with this stapler. So we'll get it. And it's even this five millimeter stapler in, in the size of this child, like a four, four and a half kilo, you know, it just sort of barely gets in there. When I do use the stapler, I always make sure that I have proximal control. You see, I have proximal control of the artery right there. So I'm sure the staple line is intact because as I said, I anticipate anything can fail. And what I used to do is I used to do the artery, the vein, and then the bronchus, but you know, you see the vein underneath, but now because I have the stapler and because the anatomy lays out better this way in a lower lobe, I do the artery. And then I dissect out the bronchus, which is directly underneath the artery. There you see the inferior pulmonary vein trunk. And I'll dissect that out a little bit, but there's a plane in front of the vein and behind the bronchus that you can dissect out so that you don't have to keep flipping the lung around. And it's, here you can see I'm just dissecting under the bronchus, taking care to hug the back wall so that I don't injure the vein. And here it is, that's the, um, we're coming across. And that's the, I'm gonna take the apical segment bronchus first because it's a, it'll give me more length on the basal trunk. So I knew that was there. It's exact same place as the artery I showed you. So I usually take the apical segment artery and bronchus separately, and then I'll take the basal trunk again using the stapler. And if you don't have a stapler, then you can, you know, if the, if it's a small enough child, you can use clips. Um, Again, I would not try to ram a 12 millimeter stapler in here, um, but you can do division 
Um, and then uh, go ahead and, and um, here you can see I'm getting under the basal trunk. You could also, you know, cut and suture this, but if you're gonna do that, you really should have single lung ventilation so that you're not losing all that um, uh, tidal volume. But here I, and the other thing I do with the bronchus is I always crush the bronchus first with a clamp before I put the stapler in. Um, the five millimeter stapler, you know, if the tissue is too thick, it will fail. So you have to kind of judge it. And what you want to do is you want to see the jaws get parallel. But, um, you know, it's a pretty remarkable device. And hopefully soon we'll have a stapler with a little bit longer uh, staples in it. But this uh, works incredibly well. You can see we'll put it down. And so we divide that. And then all that's left is the inferior pulmonary vein. You're coming up on the, it's branching here. Um, and I try to get it, um, in this case, I'm gonna take this vessel separately. This is again, going to the apical segment. And then I just get length on the um, inferior pulmonary vein trunk. And you remember that video I showed you with the ligature where I couldn't see anything. Now you'll be able to see it. So look how much length on that inferior pulmonary vein I have because I've done all this dissection and now I can be very safe. I can put the stapler, you know, again, if I didn't have the stapler, I would just dissect up to where this branches and use vessel sealing. But since I have the stapler and I have all this length, I'll put the stapler on and then you'll see I, I get it on. And then I'm gonna make sure that I have proximal control. So you see, I have proximal control. Oops, sorry. So stapler on, proximal control. And divide it. And so, you know, that it's not about being fast, but I can often do a lobectomy in well under an hour because of this technology that we have. And you can see all the hyalur vessels and it's great. Um, this was the last time I put our results together was May of last year. Um, over now I've done about 540 lung resections. The average operative time uh, for me is about, it's just under two hours, but the majority of cases honestly take around an hour now. Uh, average time for a trainee is about, you know, 50% more, not quite, but I, I, most trainees I can get through in lobectomy in under two hours. Complication rate is low and the hospital stay is an average of 2.2 days. But like I said, I like to do them when they're smaller. I think it's easier and you can see the average operative time drops to 90 minutes. Uh, average hospital stay drops to less than two days. Uh, occasionally, there may be a role for segmental resection. This is a case where I thought I was gonna do a lower lobectomy and I got in and the child had no fissure. And now these congenital clefts, and so I, I was either going to do a pneumonectomy or, or try and do sort of a non-anatomic or resection, which I thought was sort of the apical segment of his lower lobe and the posterior segment of his upper. And that got me thinking. thinking. So we do have cases where we do segmental resections. If on CT scan and at the time of surgery, it looks like the disease is clearly limited to one segment. Like in this case, it's in the apical segment of the lower lobe. Um, this is a case again, which was in the apical segment of the lower lobe. But this kid had multiple pneumonias. No, everybody said, don't do anything about it. So what I, this was a case I actually did in Italy um, because the kid kept getting sick. And so he was older. I think he was, I can't remember exactly how old he was, but you can see because now there's a, a lot of inflammation. Uh, the fissures are obscure uh, and it's just a much more difficult case. And so um, I prefer to do these earlier. Um, so these are the kids that we've done segmental resections in. Um, and I think in the appropriate case, it's, it's a good choice, but I can't tell you for sure. It's absolutely the right thing to do. If we do do a segmental resection, we always get a follow-up CT scan at a year to see if we've left behind residual disease. And I think imaging will get better in helping us determine uh, where exactly the abnormal lung is, and hopefully we'll be able to plan our surgeries better.
Um, now to take a quick change, we don't have a lot of time left, but you know, we did the first esophageal atresia repair in Berlin in 1999. That was a child with pure atresia, um, no fistula. He was about two and a half months old when we did it. Uh, we didn't really have the right instruments, but we got it together and he actually did okay. And then the first thoracoscopic TOF repair was done in Denver. I did it the following year. I was waiting for the right child. Um, and this is him, this is Connor. He was a healthy three and a half kilo baby. The parents, I told the parents I thought I could do it and they gave me permission to do it. And, and two hours later we were done and he's done great. Um, learned a few things. One, we paced, the first ones I did with the patient in a lateral decubitus, now I put him more prone. Uh, I use a, a 30 degree scope. And again, I put the, the, the trocar, as opposed to putting it here, I put it more posteriorly now. Now it's behind the tip of the scapula. My right hand's up in the axilla, as you see here. So um, scope behind the tip of the scapula, right hand up in the axilla, and left hand is just probably one or two interspaces below and just slightly behind or posterior to the scope port. And this is what it looks like. This is just a quick video. I still take the azagus mostly to get it out of the way. Some people think that if you take the azagus, it creates higher stricture formation. I don't. I don't really think there's any data for that. You know, if you want to, I just think it, you know, I don't want to put a needle in it, make it bleed. So I do dissect it out. Here you can see the fistula. Um, and it's got, the thing, the view is incredible. And so I'm able to get right on the, on the membranous portion of the trachea. So I don't leave a residual fistula. And I think this cuts down on recurrent TFs. I still use a clip in most cases, just cause it's the quickest way to get control of the fistula. In smaller babies under two kilos, I just cut it and sew it. Um, some people have said they've had problems with clip migration. I've not seen that, um, but I think you can do whatever you want. The key here is the ability to dissect out the upper pouch under direct vision. Um, and this is really key in, in long gap atresias because you can well over double the length of the upper and lower pouch. This is, was a trifurcation fistula, so this came in right at the carina just about. Um, so there's a little bit of a gap and we'll just, I cut off the tip flush. Um, I had, I, I initially I started just by making a slit, but I had a higher stricture rate. So now I cut the tip completely off. I think it gives you a little better anastomosis. I use um, four or five O PDS suture. I put the back row in first with the, with the um, knots intraluminally. And then I um, uh, put down an NG tube do the front row so that, and then I pull the tube out. I no longer leave a, an NG tube. I think it's been shown that there is a significantly higher stricture rate if you leave a transanastomotic tube. This is the smallest baby I've ever done, one kilo. I wouldn't recommend this. Uh, I got lucky and got away with it, but it's a little bit small and the tissues are, are very delicate. Um, so I, I'm not leaving chest drains anymore either. I usually get a contrast study on day four and start feeds after. This was the initial experience of the first uh, 10 years. I did about 50 cases. And you can see initially the stricture rate was higher, uh, those requiring dilation. And since I modified things, it's, it's gone down significantly. Um, we have, um, I personally have not had a recurrent fistula, but I have operated on, uh, my partners have had one. Um, and this is the results as of through 2018. We're now up to about 160. And this is what it looks like thoracoscopically. You can see no scars. We also do long gaps. The longest gap I've ever overcome is, is um, eight vertebral bodies. I don't do a Fokker procedure. I find that I can get these all together uh, in a single operation. Um, I like to do them when they're like four, six to eight weeks of age or four to eight weeks of age. I think after that, um, people, they grow more than the, than the ends grow. And so I think the gap gets longer. Um, there is some interest, uh, people are doing this, uh, Darius Petrowski and David Vanderzee are doing this as newborns, um, but I'm a little concerned about that. I think the complication rate's higher, but it may be the way to go. And they're doing kind of a stage repair, going in multiple times in the first couple of weeks orchoscopically and bringing it together. And this is the longest gap I ever got together, as I mentioned, with uh, seven and a half vertebral bodies. Also, uh, 
do H-type fistula. Oh, this is a long gap with a proximal fistula. We really don't have time to show you, but we dissect out the upper pouch. And it's got this fistula, which had been previously undiagnosed. This was referred to me from another center. And um, I dissected it out. And luckily, I, I had the stapler. And this was a perfect case since the fistula was on the sidewall. And I didn't want to lose that length. I just stapled the fistula, and it worked great. And then I also use it for H-type fistulas. We approach all our H-types orthoscopically. Before I had the, the stapler, I was using um, either sutures or clips, but I think that uh, using the stapler on this is a, it's a great way to go. And here you can see we're just putting it on. I put a loop around it to identify it and we'll just divide it. Almost there. Um, I think we see it so much better. I think there's less risk of injuring the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, and you know, you're not, you no longer have a neck incision there. You can see it's, it's divided. And uh, we've had no recurrent fistulas. Vascular rings, I'll just mention briefly, we do do a number of vascular rings. Uh, this is a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian. Um, you can see there's a, re so it, there's the vagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So we're basically ligating the this arteriosis. Um, and you can do this with ties, you can do it with clips, or you can do it with a stapler. In that case, I did it with a stapler. Um, and this was a, a larger kid, obviously. And then this is a case of a double aortic arch. This is a baby who also had a TF. My partner did the initial case and went in and ligated the fistula on the other side. This was not diagnosed initially. And then we went back in a few weeks later into the left chest. So the, here's the atretic left arch right there. Um, and so we're gonna, and we're gonna go ahead and, and ligate um, the ductus and the left arch. So that's the ductus. And in this case, we're using a clip. It was before we had the stapler. Um, And then divide it, and then we're going to do the same thing on the atretic arch. But you really need to be comfortable with your anatomy and, and know kind of what's going on in order to do these kind of cases. And then this is another double arch. We also do all our CDH hysteroscopically if the babies are stable enough. Um, obviously, if, I believe if they're on ECMO or they have basically no diaphragm, we don't do it, but I think the visualization is incredible. You can't put in a patch, but again, these are sick babies. Uh, they don't tolerate, I wouldn't spend eight hours or five hours doing the surgery. This is a surgery you need to be able to do relatively quickly. Um, it's a one that I think it's reasonable to use a knot pusher if you need to. Um, and, but I think in a, in a relatively stable baby that has some reserve, you can do this. And now this is one of the newest things we're doing. We're doing scoliosis surgery. This is called vertebral body tethering. And we go in thoracoscopically and put in these screws in the vertebral bodies and then put in a clothesline between them. Um, and we're doing about one of these a week now. And it's really been, I work with my orthopedic surgeon and it's been incredible. It's a huge advance um, in those kids who have idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this, but we also have a chest wall clinic and two chest wall deformity, obviously the nest procedure. Um, and it's been, you know, really, been remarkable what it's allowed us to do. We also have a pectus, large pectus carinatum practice, but we now use uh, the dynamic compression brace that was made by uh, Marcelo Martinez Ferro, which has revolutionized pectus carinatum treatment. Um, and we probably have 200 kids in braces. And I think, you know, we try to do a lot of telementoring. Uh, this is me telementoring a case uh, with Todd Ponsky. He's in in Ohio and I'm in Denver and I'm helping him do a lobectomy. Um, and Todd trained with me and we have a good relationship so we can, it's easy for us to talk and operate this way. He's a gifted surgeon. and But this was an, an, a way to bridge that initial gap when he was doing these cases on his own. So tips, use gravity, um, use insufflation, get anesthesia on your side, whatever it takes, bribe them. Be patient. You need to take beta blockers so you don't 
be too nervous and do an anatomic dissection. Don't take shortcuts. And first do no harm. So, you know, again, thoracotomy on first look doesn't look bad, but there is significant morbidity. But this is another child who came to my chest wall clinic who had had a quote unquote muscle sparing thoracotomy for his uh, lung resection as an infant. You can see he's got significant chest wall morbidity. And then I always show this picture in 2004, I got to go to Madrid and do the first thoracoscopic lung resection of a CPAM. And the mother is so grateful that every year, this is um, Teresa and every year on Teresa's birthday, the mother sends me a new picture of her. Uh, and she's turned into this beautiful young woman. And so I think it, it has a huge impact um, and uh, uh, really makes a difference. So I encourage all pediatric surgeons to think about the consequences of what we do. And I've been very fortunate. I've got to travel all over the world. I've got to come to India a few times. I hope I get to come again someday uh, to try and teach this. Uh, but it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of wear and tear. And I do think my office often wonders where I am. They don't know what to do with me now because I've been home for six months. I haven't been on an airplane, uh, but this was a gift they gave me, you know, where's Waldo? Uh, but I've been very fortunate. Um, and I think this says it best, you know, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. So you can put your head in the sand or in Colorado, put it in the snow, or you can look around and see what's going on. And it's actually quite beautiful. I think there's nothing more beautiful and fun to do than complex thoracoscopy. And so you need to kind of follow your dream. Uh, this is a very old uh, ad, but I, it still hits home with me. And it says, money doesn't wait at the top of the hill. Glory doesn't wait at the top of the hill. All that waits at the top of the hill is the top of the hill. And I think uh, that has a lot to do with how we pursue our goals. So I showed you this picture before. This is Jessica, my oldest daughter. Uh, this was when we lived in England, and, and this is when she was just uh, two and a half years old. And she's followed her dream, and we've climbed a lot of mountains together. Uh, and now, for any of you who saw La La Land, uh, that's her right there. So it always helps to have a goal, follow it, and work hard. Anyway, I appreciate your attention. It's been a great uh, honor to get to talk with you this morning. And uh, this is my family, my support group, who's allowed me to, to travel all over the world and teach and develop these. And without them, I wouldn't have accomplished uh, any of what I've done. So thanks very much. Um, I, and uh, again, it's been a great honor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rothenberg. Uh, we have a few minutes delay, not minutes, few seconds delay on YouTube uh, uh, telecast. Yeah. But uh, yeah, all like, uh, yeah, I wish uh, you would have been with us so that you can hear all the applaud. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do this. And, uh, you know, I hope someday we can all be in the same auditorium and, and, uh, and get a chance to do this again and operate together. Yes. You've made it sound so good, uh, Steve. It almost appeared you were giving so much credit to that technology that I think you deserved much more credit <laughs> and the technology to go with it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I've, I've been lucky. You know, I it's uh, I, I you know I I got trained by some very good people and then it applied well. I kind of hit it at the right time and. And I've been gotten people interested in developing the technology that we need to make it easier. I mean, it was much harder, but um, I've been very fortunate. And I think my goal has always been to make this so it is easier for surgeons who don't have as much experience, you know, and as much background. Because the truth is, no one will ever get trained like I got trained again. No one will ever be able to do a general thoracic fellowship and do hundreds of cases and then use that to apply to to thoracoscopic surgery. So we have to figure out ways to train people better. And, and I, I think it'll come, but I think these devices make it easier. So we have a few questions which, uh, which are coming on the YouTube chat. Uh, first of all, I, have, I got very interested when you showed tele-mentoring and uh, I wish you can do it for us sometime. The time difference will be a problem, but as you said, I will bribe my anesthetist <laughs> so that we don't get a case at night. <laughs> So anyway, my well, wife I think, 
because yeah, I think when you have the right relationship and the right, you know, it's the problem with telementoring is one, you have to know the surgeon. You have to have a relationship so that if I say stop, stop, you know, you have to be able to communicate adequately. Um, and in the States, it's a problem because if I telementor somebody, you know, do I have to have a consent? Do I have to have malpractice coverage? Do I have to have hospital privileges? But we have, I have another talk on telementoring that if you want someday, I'd be happy to do. But, you know, I telementored a surgeon doing a, a thymectomy in Paris. And I was able to keep her. She was about ready to fry the phrenic nerve, and I was able to stop her in time to prevent that. So, yeah. so uh, uh, we have a question from Dr. Monica Nanda, and she wants to know: Do you have any experience in pleurodesis for malignant pleural effusion in children? Uh, I'm sorry. Experience in what? Uh, pleurodesis. Like you, oh, pleurodesis. Yeah. So I mean, that's tough. We have some, you know. In those cases, I think it's reasonable to do a chemical pleurodesis. Uh, you know, put in something like doxycycline or something else that's fairly abrasive and toxic uh, for malignant effusions. I, I don't like doing that for just regular effusions because I don't want to scar the lung that way in case someone ever needs to go in. But you know, that sort of tetracycline or something like that, um, talc. Uh, powder we use. So I think it, it just kind of depends. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Prakash Agrawal. Uh, he is saying, uh, what do you think is the reason for high recurrence rate in thoracoscopic uh, CDH surgeries? Uh, I think surgeons who, so unfortunately, so if you look at the good series from good institutions, the recurrence rate is not higher. But I think for some reason, that's the one operation that everybody thinks they can do thoracoscopically, even though these can often be the sickest kids. And I think it's because they put the, the, they do the repair under too much tension. And it's hard to tell really how much tension you have thoracoscopically as opposed to when you're, you know, doing it through an open incision. And so I think people are just make, you know, doing it too tight, not getting good enough bites. I also think that you need to, you need to cauterize around the rim of the muscle if you're not, so that you get healing. Because otherwise you're just so, sewing, you know, you're kind of sewing pleura to pleura and there's not innate healing. So as the child grows, gaps develop between the sutures. Um, so I would just say, if you, think, if you think you might need a patch, then put in a patch because it means you do. Just don't, don't make it too tight. Uh, then there was a lot of discussion going on the uh, YouTube chat about uh, metallic clips versus hemologs. The, the plastic hemologs. Uh, so what is your preference? Uh, same you know, I, I think either is fine. Um, I, I, like I said, I try to use clips as little as possible. Metal clips are just more readily available, but I think using hemologs is fine. I think, you know, I have seen hemolock clips come off, at, you know, use them proximally and distantly, and I've seen them come off, but I've seen metal clips come off and I've seen metal clips tear. So I think, I think hemoclips are fine. I, I don't have a big preference. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Zahur. Uh, he wants to know, uh, on an average in a lobectomy, how many staplers you usually fire? Um, so in a, usually I'll take the artery with the sealer and then I'll use the stapler on the bronchus and I'll use it on the inferior pulmonary trunk just to be quick. You know, it just makes it simple and easy. So two loads. Two, two. Okay, two loads. Uh, what do you want? Hmm? Like indications to convert. And, uh, so uh, Dr. Masik Shah uh, wants to know uh, when uh, we will get 3mm sealer and 5mm stapler in India. <laughs> what? When we will get. Well, yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, I would love for you to have it. I mean, you guys are great technicians, and I think you could use it. Unfortunately, you know, this it's you have to have a distributor, and the, it's more expensive than the the larger stuff because it's harder to make. And I think you know we're we're distributing, and we now distribute in the Middle East. We're distributing in South America, but cost is an issue. Um, uh, and, you know, I think it's like the sealer is the perfect thing for a pull-through operation for Hirschsprungs or imperfect anus. 
I use the stapler now on all the imperfect anus fistulas because you get it just right against the bladder. So my hope is that, you know, the class will be able to come down soon, sometime soon. And, and that also there'll be a real interest in India and someone wants to distribute it. It's just, um, but you know, it's harder to make. It's just like the, you know, good surgical instruments cost more than crappy surgical instruments. It's, it's just the way it is. So, um, but I would love for you guys to have it. I, I think you would do great things with it. And there's a question about H-type fistula. So will you do all of your s type fistulas thoracoscopically or there's a level where you'll prefer to go through neck? neck and no, they're all, they're all in the same place. It's a very, you can get to all of them through the chest. You can't okay. through an open thoracotomy. Don't get me wrong, an open thoracotomy, it's almost impossible to get to, but because thoracoscopically you can look up there, you can, you can see it beautifully. And then you follow that plane a very clear plane between the esophagus and the trachea that you see much better than through a neck incision. And so I, I do them all now through the chest. You know, it, you don't have to, but I think, again, I think there's less chance of injury to recurrent laryngeal. And um, I just prefer that technique because I can see. Okay. Uh Dr. Raj Kishore Bagri is asking, uh, do you have uh, any, your experience about chylothorax or maybe thoracic duct ligations? So yeah, I so I use, I you mostly use vessel sealing. I go down, dissect out, you know, at near the hiatus and just, it, sometimes you can see the thoracic duct um, with magnification. I want to try and use the um, endocyanine green to see if we can see it. I haven't had a case yet, but, but I'll just seal I'll just seal in that area with the vessel sealer, and we've had really good success with that. Any questions? Can I pop a question in between? Yes, please. Yeah, so Steve, that was an excellent talk. Uh, just one question about the crucial single lung ventilation aspect of thoracoscopic surgeries. Uh, I think for any beginner surgeon or the surgeons who are attempting neonatal thoracoscopy, keeping the same side lung down is very crucial. Because a lot of yeah. times the anatomy is favorable, but, but the lung is there, right. which is jumping in front of you and the anesthetist is not able to control it. And sometimes you have to convert just because right. the lung is com coming too much in your way. You described a list of three or four methods where you would, you know, uh, try to keep the lung down. So what is your right. preferred method in the neonates? And uh, maybe it is, if it is different in the elder children. Yeah, my preferred method except for in children large enough for a double lumen endotracheal tube. And that's a, the smallest one is a 26 French. So, you know, they need to be about 50, 50 pounds, 20, 25 yeah. kilos. It's just to do a main stem intubation of the contralateral side. And that's actually quite easy to do. And almost all these kids will tolerate it. Um, and it's quick. You know, if, if often you can do it blindly. Certainly if it's a right main stem, if you're operating on the left side, it almost always goes. But if you, if you turn the child's neck and if you push the patient on the right side down and push the tube down, often it'll go on the left side. But if you need to, you can do a bronchoscopy and easily get it down there for them. It's just quick, it's easy. It gives you almost good lung isolation. I always use insufflation as well. So I use a pressure you know, of around six to help that little extra bit of overventilation. And I just think it's the easiest thing to do. You can spend, you're an anesthetist because they don't get to do it a lot, can spend two hours trying to get a bronchial blocker in. And that's crazy. So that's my preference. What is the, what are the chances of using an additional retracting port which can keep pressure on the lung and keep it out of your way? Is that a possibility? Have you ever you used can. it? You can, that's how I started. But honestly, it, for me, it gets in the way. I think if you decide you need a fourth port to give you exposure, absolutely. You know, just try to put it in a place that it doesn't get in your way and that your assistant can hold it and work. I just don't need, I, I don't need to do it. Um, uh, you know, I just, I, I like not having the extra clutter and it's worked out okay for me. But, you know, the bottom line is if you need an extra port, whether you're doing thoracoscopy or or laparoscopy, you should put it in and do it. Thank you. Go ahead with your questions. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go because they're waiting for me in the OR. I apologize.
Um, okay. But I'd be happy to get, if you know, if questions come up, you can email me and I'll be happy to answer them, um, you know, to try and answer the rest. I apologize for having to leave a little early, but um, again, I really appreciate you uh, giving me this opportunity. It's great to see you guys. I wish I could see everybody. Um, and I'd love to hear whatever feedback you get from the talk. Um, this is one of my favorite talks to give and, uh, and I'm always trying to make it a little bit better. Our pleasure. Our pleasure, Dr. Rathenberg. All right. You guys have a great day. Yeah. Same to you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. I think that was nice, Kitby. Oh, yeah. I mean, this guy is obviously 